New York, 1968. I was still in the rampage. I wasn't hooked up with anyone. And uh, my friend Tommy Spiro came to me and said that his uncle wanted to talk to me. I went and met Shorty Spiro. We shook hands. It was warm. He's an ex-fighter. His nose was smashed a little bit. Looked like a tough guy, tough guy reputation. And he told me, Sammy, let me tell you something. You got a hell of a reputation for a young guy. You're tough with your hands, a little too tough. You're going to raise your hands to somebody one day, and you're going to get yourself killed because you're not hooked up. You don't belong to nobody. I want to make you an offer to come with me. I'll tell you a few things. I'll never backstab. I'll never betray you. I'll never lie to you. And when I ask you to do things, you'll know that I have already done them, and I might even come with you when you do them. I knew exactly what he was talking about. I knew the reputation of the Mafia. But it was music to my ears to hear someone tell me that he would never backstab or lie. Or... Then he told me, once you hook up with me, you'll belong to a family. And you'll have backing, full backing. And we'll school you and teach you. I like what I heard. I shook his hand. I knew at that point I was with the mob. I was an associate with the Colombo family. For the first time ever, Sammy the Bull Gravano tells his story. This is our thing. Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, 1959. When I was young, early in my life, I was uh, dyslexic. I screwed up in school, something awful. I got in trouble a whole bunch of times. One time I got caught playing hooky with a bunch of my friends, and I went in, and there was truant officers and principal, and he was fucking talking to the teachers and really bullshitting about us, but not about us, about me. He was talking about our families and grease balls, and this is how they are, these people. I listened to it. The word grease ball didn't bother me. It's a, so, a ra racist remark against Italians. It didn't bother me. We used that word ourselves. It, it didn't affect me all that much. It bothered me that they were talking about my mother and father. And I got up and I told him, bro, I did this. I played hooky. Has them, they're my mother and father working hard every day. They're good people. I did this. What do you want? Stay away from my mother and father. He said something to the teachers again. He like bypassed me and just said, see how these fucking grease balls are? And I cracked him a fucking shot with everything I had. And I broke his jaw. I got thrown out of. That junior high school, shallow junior high school, I was left back twice in the fourth grade, the seventh grade. I was already a total fuck up in school. They didn't know what that was, that it was a learning disability, not you were fucking stupid or fucking anything else. They didn't know how to deal with it back then. Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, 1969. Well, the early days, it was almost like Goodfellas. We, I started going into uh, the houses. We lived together, ate together, hung out together. It was similar to the Rampers, but it was on a whole nother level. I could give you an example of one thing that happened. I was still friendly with my friends, and we decided to do a bank robbery. 
One of my friends told me about a guard comes out of an armored truck, goes in a back door, it was a big metal door, and he goes in and he gets money from the bank and he brings it out. He comes down a hallway and he brings it into the armored truck and they take off and whatever they do with it. And uh, he had an inside guy who would leave the door unlocked, slightly open. So I could go into the bank in that hallway, not into the actual bank where the people were, but into that hallway, get the guy as he was coming out and take him. I told my friends and we all decided to do this. I told my friends to watch the door, keep it open, and watch my back. I'll go into the bank after he's gone for a couple of seconds, and I'll take him, and then I'll come out. We did that. I went in, I prepared myself the way the whole circular hallway he couldn't see me until he made a little bit of a turn. I would pull out the gun and uh, take the bag away from him. Everything was working perfect. I heard the click of the door, the inside door. The gun was out. I was pointing it in the direction. The only thing that went a little crazy was it wasn't one guard. There was three of them. As soon as they saw me, they froze. They put their hands towards their guns. My gun was already out. And I just yelled to them, if you go for that gun, I'll kill you. They froze a little bit. Push the bags over here. I really didn't even give a shit about the bags anymore. I was in trouble. I knew I couldn't turn my back to run out. They would pull those guns out and I would be finished. They kicked over the bags. I grabbed one of the bags, maybe two. One of them I half dropped. I was very nervous, probably a little scared. I knew I was in way over my head. I backed up and backed up. I told them to get down. They got down to their knee. Their hands were away from the gun. I could make my move. I made my move. I went through the outside door, slammed the door fucking shut. I saw as I was just about doing this, that they were definitely going for the guns. I screamed to my friends, run, run, come on, I can't. I felt the pressure of the door. They were pushing, they were trying to push this metal door open. I had my foot against it. I couldn't make this move. I knew as soon as I let go in this door, this door would come flying open and I would be shot. I didn't know what the fuck to do. It was 86th Street, a lot of people walking. I saw a little pack of people coming down and I thought to myself, if I let go of this door and fuck the money and just run right through that pack, maybe when they come out, there'll be too many people and they'd be afraid to shoot. <sighs> They're screaming to me, my friends, and I'm screaming to them. Just go. They're running, but they're looking back like they don't want to leave me. And uh, finally, I make the move. I let go of the door. I run straight for the pack. I could hear the door opening. I run right through the pack. 
of people. Those shots. I run to the corner. I make a quick turn, and there's a guy there, and he yells to me. I don't know who the fuck this guy is. Sammy, come in the house. Come on, I got you. I don't know what else to do, but listen to him. Knew my name, and he's doing something. I, not trying to stop me. And I run into this two, three, four family home. We run up the stairs. And he tells me, give me the gun. I'll put it away. I'm so confused. I'm thinking, trying to think my way out of this situation. I decide not to give him the gun. I don't know who the fuck this guy is. I don't know what the fuck is going on. I'm not going to give him the gun. I don't give him the gun, and he tells me, I'll go down and check what's going on. He mentions one of the guys. I don't remember who the fuck he mentioned, but he mentions one of them. I got you, bro. Don't worry about nothing. You could hide in this upon my apartment. He leaves. A matter of minutes, he's back. I'm thinking about putting the gun and hiding it in his house. He says, there's a lot of police. Not a big deal. I think it's half over. There's cops all over the place, people talking, but they don't know. They're not coming over here. They're not coming here. Leave me the gun and just walk out and go back to where you hang out. It's not too far from this bank. I could walk there. I decide to do that. But again, I decide not to leave the gun. I don't want to give up the gun. I leave the house, the house and I go to the corner where we hang out. My friends are there, what the fuck happened? And I'm telling them what happened. I said, bro, I couldn't let go of the door. I couldn't really grab every fucking thing. I just, there's three guys I walked into. There was supposed to be one. It would have been easy. I could have walked right over to him and took the gun. I can't take guns away, get that close to three guys and try to take their guns. So it's over. A couple of days goes by and uh, I walk out of the luncheonette, me and Lenny DeMoe, I get into a car. The car is surrounded with 10, 15 guys. Everybody screaming with guns pointing at us. Don't move, don't move. I think I'm about to be killed, but I'm not. They're cops. I'm arrested for bank robbery. The guard picked my picture out of a mug book. Shorty calls me when I get out. And he tells me, come my Persico wants to see me. I get in the car and I go down to see Carmine Persico. And uh, he tells me, you got an angel watching over you. I said, okay, why? He said, the God is McIntosh. McIntosh was one of his top shooters. McIntosh is a cousin to the God who picked you out of the mug book. We could take care of this. Wow. This is, yeah, this is heavenly. He says he wants $10,000. And I'm going to give him the $10,000 for you. And you'll owe me the $10,000. I says, that's great. Come on, I, I don't even know how to thank you. Yeah, this is great. He says, okay, until you pay it back, you'll pay three points. That's like 300 a week. And I said, come on, I robbed the bank because I'm broke. I mean, I, I don't know if I could pay you 300 a week. He, he goes into a tirade. He's 
fuming. Who the fuck are you? You were just facing seven and a half to 15 years for a bank robbery. I'm, I got the connection with Macintosh. I'm putting up the 10,000 and you can't pay me $300? Who the fuck do you, who are you? The money don't come down from me to you. It comes up from you to me. I, I says, come on, please take it easy. I, 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 I'm, I made a mistake. You, you're a thousand percent right. I apologize. I didn't mean it in a way that I'm not going to pay. I, I meant it would be hard. But no, I'll, 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 the money will be here every week. I apologize. I learned a good lesson. I learned that the mafia has tremendous connections. If it wasn't for them, I would have did seven and a half to 15 years in prison. He not only knew the guy through Macintosh, he put up the money, got me a lawyer, and I'm complaining about paying juice. I will never make that fucking mistake again for as long as I live in Gozen Austria or in any life. He deserved total respect. Not a stupid kid saying something about, I can't pay the money, I'm broke. What kind of bullshit is that? I learned a lesson about Gozen Austria for a multitude of reasons. The power that they had, the connections that they had. And I was part of this. This is not a gang. This is not a club. This is a secret society and a brotherhood that don't play. You fuck up, they'll take your life. You do the right thing, you'll get respect. Love. Loyalty. Benzenhurst, Brooklyn, 1968. So now that I started expanding with Shylock and making some monies and we were robbing and doing things, we wanted to open up a little business. So we knew this guy who was in the fruit and vegetable business, and he loved horses, especially the horse Kelso. So we would call him, his name was Joe, Joe Kelso. So we grabbed him and we said, listen, quit your job and we'll open up a little fruit and vegetable store. You'll be a partner with us and we'll open up this store. And that's what we did. We built the store up a little bit and we put the name of the store was Joe Kelso's Fruit and Vegetable Store. And he would work and come in and wait on the customers and he knew what there was to know about that kind of business. There was a back room. We would go in the back room. It was almost like a little club to us. We would go in there and hang out and bullshit and play cards and plan things and do all kinds of bullshit. And uh, one day he opens up the door and he says, Sammy, look at this. This woman is robbing us. So I go by the door and I look out, out the door and there's an old lady in her 60s. And she's taking some stuff, grapes or whatever she was stealing and putting it in a bag and she would sneak it out. So I was like, what do you want me to do? So he says, Sammy, we can't allow that. So I was, we would always joke and goof on each other and I told him, listen, Joe, go over there in that desk over there, open up the drawer, there's a gun in the drawer. Go over there, shoot her in the fucking head, and then we'll get rid of the body. Now, he was a legitimate guy. He was scared to death. You want me to shoot her? I started laughing. I said, no. I said, but what the fuck you want me to do, bro? He says, I'll talk to her. I said, all right, I'll talk to her. I go out and I went over to her, senora. You're robbing this stuff. It's our store. It's my store. You're robbing us. 
Okay, okay, but uh, we broke, I'm broke. Me too. I'm broke too. Listen to me, don't rob me. Take it, bring it to the Joe over there at the counter. Let him ring it up, put it in your bag, and tell him, put it on Sammy's tab. <laughs> so she does that. And whatever the tab was, I took a few dollars out, I threw it in the register, hey, she paid. And whenever she comes here, I give her what she wants, put it on my tab, tell me what it is. And a couple of days, maybe a week later, I'm in the back again, he comes over, he says, Sammy, you ruined my life. How'd I ruin your life? What the fuck did I do now? He said, look, look outside. I look out the door again, and there's, the place is crowded. All kinds of old people buying shit. So I said, it looks good. She's probably talking good about us, and uh, look, we got a lot of customers. He said, but none of them are paying. They're bringing it to the counter, and they're telling me, put it on Sammy's tab. <laughs> I said, well, I'm not gonna pay for it. I said, listen, Joe, we're already setting up a little club that we're opening up. We're gonna go. I'm gonna leave here. You keep the whole business, it's yours. Keep it. I don't want nothing. It's yours, good luck. You're a great partner. I'm not, this isn't a good business for me. And uh, I'm not gonna keep paying for all this stuff. And then give it to them. Half the times you throw it away, it's getting rotten. So give it to them. No, no, I, all right, kid. thank you, Sammy, but I'll, I'll work it out. Good. Listen, don't ever let somebody come and tell me that you're giving these old people a hard time. They're all broke, bro. Don't do that. And I left. Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, 1957. I went to another school. McKinley Junior High School was in another neighborhood. Not that many Italians, mostly Irish, Swedish, Polish people. It was a different neighborhood. I was a good looking kid. I got along with the women, but the men, the boys, every day I was in a fucking fight. A couple of times I would get jumped and the rampers would not find out, you got jumped, bro? Yes. Where they stay? In the McKinley Park at night. We would steal a car, go fucking flying down to McKinley Park, jump out, and break their fucking asses. They learned that jumping me, they wanted to fight a fair fight, I fight. But jumping me, there was going to be retaliation for it. But I got thrown out of that school as well. Then I went to 600 school. It's a borderline of uh, a children's jail or something. It's not a children's jail. It's borderline. Next step is, is that. It's every fuck up in the, in the city goes to this school. To cover my not being able to spell or read, numbers didn't look alike. Nothing looked right to me, and it was very difficult. I would joke a little bit like a class clown, to cover the, the hurt of not being able to do certain things, I guess. And one day in the schools, the guy, the teacher said something. I made a joke out of it. They were all laughing. There was a kid in front of me, stood up, long black coat, almost down to past his knees. And he got up and he was hollering at me. And he had a Bible in a, or something in his hand, looked like a Bible. And as he's talking to me, he started patting me on the head with a boom, boom, boom. By about the fourth tap, I cracked him. I knocked him out cold. And I got thrown out of the entire school system. So I was out. I was done with school. New York, 1970. In the rampers, it was one thing, you know, Robin, it was a gang. In the mafia, as even an associate, it was a whole nother ball game. So one of my first experiences dealing with the mafia at this level, me and my friends, we went and we did a burglary on a clothing store. There's no uh, alarm on the store. 
we got together and we hit this store. We took everything. Then we started selling stuff. Two days later, Shorty calls me and tells me, we have to go down to see Joe Colombo himself. He wants to talk to you. Joe Colombo wants to talk to me? Yeah. I go down with uh, Shorty and I meet with Joe Colombo. Joe Colombo tells me, from what I understand, you robbed the clothing store. And I said, yes, I did. He said, the guy who owns the store is a friend of mine. You got to give the stuff back. I'm a little stunned, but this guy's the boss of the family. I tell him, okay, uh, I sold a few things, but we'll get everything back. Even the stuff we sold, we'll go give the people the money back. Well, I'll get everything back. Nods his head, okay, get it done, Sammy. And uh, I went back to my friends and told them what happened. They were all sick about it, but it is what it is. This is not a game. This is not, you know, it's us against the world. This is the mafia at a very high level. We agree. We got to give it back. We give it back. We bring it to the store. The guy is there and who owns the store. And we bring everything back, car after car after car, loaded with stuff. Shirts, pants, suits, you name it, we're bringing it back. A couple of days, maybe a week later, I get called again. I grab my friends, hey bro, did we give every fucking thing back? I'm being sent for again. No, we got everything, Sammy. I mean, we got even some of the stuff we gave it away. We got the, we got the stuff back and we, we gave everything. All right, so I go there. Walk over and Joe Colombo is there again. He said, I appreciate what you did, Sammy. Everything was there. I appreciate it. I talked to my friend and I asked him a question. Do you have insurance? He said, yeah, I had insurance. And you reported the theft, right? Yeah, I did. So the insurance company is going to give you a check. Is that right? Yeah. And now I'm telling them I have to go buy the stuff, which I don't. I got it all back. So Joe Colombo tells his friend, these kids who robbed this store, they're broke. Good kids, street kids. So you're going to get an insurance check and you're getting all the clothes back. You're gonna make a little score out of this. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll be way ahead of the game. Well, what I want is half of that check, which you get. And these kids are gonna get that money. They put up their balls and they stole. When I asked them to bring it back, they brought it back. You told me they brought everything back. Yes, they did. Good. Cash that check and give me that money. And the guy's going to give me the money, he told me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you and your friends the money. I like the way you conduct yourself, Sammy. I appreciate it, Joe. And, and I'll put together a package for you. For No, no, no. Don't give me anything. Keep it amongst your friends. Keep doing what you're doing, Sammy. Be honorable. You didn't try to lie, and you did everything you were told to do. That's your gift to me, not the money. Everything I hear about you from Carmine Persico, from Shorty, I like. And I got my ear to the street, just like I knew you robbed the store. So go and enjoy yourself. This guy really, really won my heart at that time. 
To me, Joe Colombo was the man. I had tremendous respect for him for doing that. When I went back to my friends, they were stunned. So I said, we're, we're going to get half of that money. I, I think it's more than we would have got selling the stuff because we were selling the dirt cheap. We had a couple of drinks, laughing, talking. And uh, that was one of my first experiences with the mafia as being an associate. And to have someone like him, to have that kind of respect or show that kind of respect was amazing. It taught me a lot. One day early on, they're starting to use me a little bit more. I had this reputation from the rampers and everything, so they wanted to use me. I'm doing things, I'm in the street. Shorty tells me that Carmine wants to see me, Carmine Persico. I go down there and he tells me about some guy who is uh, fucking around with somebody's wife. And he wants me to go there and uh, give this guy a tremendous beating. And he wants his ear. I joined the Rampers.